Is listening to certain types of music a sin? Were all the apostles martyrs? Our guests answer these questions and more. I'm Ruben Cuarrubias. Bible Help Desk is just getting started. Welcome to Bible Help Desk. Thanks for not just joining me today, but also studying along with me and our guests today. We are here seeking answers to your Bible questions together. So don't forget to send in your questions. You can text us or call in with your questions at 833-BIBLEHD or send it in via Facebook, Instagram, or our website, hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. Don't forget to leave us an email so we can contact you right back. To help us answer those questions today, we have with us Dr. Kessia Rain Bennett. Dr. Bennett comes to us from Happy Valley, Oregon, where she lives with her husband Joshua and daughters. She is currently serving as the lead pastor of the Pleasant Valley Church and recently earned her PhD in systematic theology. Dr. Bennett, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Thank you, glad to be here. Also joining us is Pastor Hadid Cortez. Pastor Cortez was born in Montemorelos, Mexico to a pastoral family. He has a bachelor's in religion and music and also recently graduated with a master's in divinity. He is currently the head pastor of a district in New Jersey where he lives with his wife, Jessica. Welcome to the program, Pastor Cortez. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, to start, I want to read to you the verse of the day, and it says, The Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's found in Deuteronomy 31, 8. This is such a wonderful promise I know that I continually come back to, especially for a lot of us that may feel fear, anxiety, but to know that God goes ahead of us that God is never going to forsake us, that He is there for us. Even in those moments where we feel, is God there? He is there. That is the promise of this text. And I hope as you watch our program today, as you continue studying the Bible and, and diving into His words, may you remember this promise that God goes ahead of us and He is there for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this verse that you've given us, for this promise that you say that you will go ahead of us. And as we dive into your word and as we address maybe some fears and some anxieties that, that we have, may you remind us that you are there for us and you will never leave us. Be with our guests today as we answer these questions from our viewers. And may the Holy Spirit be with them. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our first question that comes to us via text from Kathleen. And it says, is listening to soul music a sin? Well, Pastor Cortez, I'm going to toss this question to you as someone who has a bachelor's degree in religion and also music. This seems right up your alley. And I'm going to just say any type of music, you know, secular music. I know I myself have had this question uh, asked to me myself is, is secular music something Christians shouldn't be listening to? Is it a sin? What does the Bible say? You know, that is a great question. And it's one that requires really a lot of soul searching, a lot of discernment from our part. So I think when we, when we ask whether something is a sin, we need to go back to our understanding of what a sin is. Sometimes we may think that sinning is just merely breaking one of the Ten Commandments, but we know that it goes a little bit more deeper than that. Mm -hmm. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that if we ever think about killing someone, not just doing it, or even if we lust after someone, that is already a sin because we have committed it in our mind. So in essence, sin is anything that separates us or like um, brings us apart from God. And by that criteria, I can't really say that listening to music is sinful, but we can argue that listening to certain songs can lead us to have sinful thoughts, which does lead to sin. And I think there are two main ways it, by which this happens in music. First is through lyrics. A lot of songs contain lyrics that suggest or depict sinful ac actions such as sexual immorality, greed, 
envy, hate, and there are even some songs that talk about death, about murder, and really dark topics. So when we listen to this music, it can, it can very easily bring up images and feelings that take us away from godliness. And another way that this happens is through the associations that we have with music. And this is where we can kind of talk about genre and style, because some musical styles are associated with certain acts or contexts that may stir sinful emotions or thoughts. And we need to be mindful of this as well. However, I would be very careful of labeling uh, complete genres or styles as inherently sinful because of this, because people may associate musical styles differently than you and me. Yeah. But overall, I think if we look to Philippians 4 verse 8, uh, we have a good principle to follow when we listen to music, where the Apostle Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And if we apply this to how we listen to music, whether it be Christian, secular, in any style, I think there's a lot of music that fits this criteria, not only in the Christian front, but I would argue that there is even some quote-unquote secular music that follows this criteria. Mm. So rather than wondering if the music itself, it's sinful, or the genre, the style, I beg our listeners and our readers to think about where does your mind go when you listen to music? When I'm listening to this song, when I'm, what associations come to my mind? Am I thinking about the beauty of the music? Am I thinking about godly things? Am I thinking... Or am I being transported to somewhere that I know I shouldn't be? Or am I thinking about doing things that I probably shouldn't be feeling? Mm. I think this is a great principle to apply when we listen to music in any context. Mm. Thank you so much, Pastor Cortez. It's, it's very insightful to, to think about music from the standpoint of how does it make me think or what do I think of when I'm listening to these songs? A lot of times we don't li pay attention to the lyrics or a lot of times we're not... Uh, making sure what the lyrics say. So I appreciate you saying to take that time because a lot of times we just don't want to do that. We just want to know, is this bad or good? Tell me and then I'll, I'll either stop it or, or keep it going. But you're having us dive in, think about it, learn about it. And so I really appreciate that uh, in guiding us in this direction with this, with this very thought-provoking question. Thank you so much, Pastor Cortez. Our next question comes to us via text from Keith. And it says, were all the apostles martyrs? Great question. Uh, Pastor Cortez, I'm going to turn to you again with this question on the apostles. I know we've, we've heard of some of them being martyrs, but our particular friend Keith wants to know where all of them martyrs. Is there any historical record? Does the Bible mention any of this? Well, to adequately answer this question, I think we need we need to go back to what the word martyr means. The word martyr comes from the, weak, the Greek word martus, which simply means witness. It is a witness in a trial, test, um, just testifying to the things that they have experienced or saw related to whatever issue was going on. And so if we go by this criteria, we can say that the apostles were all martyrs or witnesses to Jesus Christ. And not only were the apostles, but all Christians, even those living now who publicly profess the goodness of God in their lives. However, we usually use the word martyr now to refer to someone who dies for their belief. And by this criteria, we only have one clear example of this in the, in the case of the apostles. And we find this in the case of James in Acts 12, verses 1 and 2, where it says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, this is, as I said, the only case in, uh, in Scripture where we see one of the apostles being persecuted and killed for their beliefs. But if we look to the historical record from the early church fathers and according to the tradition of the early church, we do believe that all of the apostles but one, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, were killed for their faith in Christ. We have the 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 historical record of Peter being crucified upside down in Rome around the year 66. We know that Andrew was crucified in Greece. Uh, the apostle Thomas is said to have even reached uh, 
India, where he was executed by the authorities there. We also have examples of Philip in Carthage, Matthew in Ethiopia. And I could go on detailing, but I think this just uh, shows some of the, the some of the historical record of apostles being killed for their faith. Now, as I mentioned, there was only one apostle. He died of natural causes, and this is the apostle John. But even John was persecuted for spreading the gospel. We know that he was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he received the vision by which he wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, And so what is really interesting is that all these people that knew Jesus, they went out into different areas and they shared their faith. And in every part, they were persecuted and most, uh, except one, died for their faith. But it is it serves as a great witness, not only to the people around them, but to us to have the same amount of confidence and the same zeal for 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 their faith as and we can apply that into our own lives as well. I appreciate that uh, when we can see that we can all be some sort of martyr, all a witness to what has God done for us. Uh, Dr. Bennett, was there anything you'd like to add uh, to this question about martyrdom? I loved bringing it back to that. Uh, theme of being a witness to what we've seen and heard. I love that so much. And it just was reminding me of some of the indications we have in the New Testament that although there were 12 that were set apart as distinctive and special in terms of the apostles, as recorded in Acts chapters 1 and 2, that there were other apostles that uh, didn't have quite that same role, but we're still considered apostles. And for that, I think of Romans chapter 16, verse 7, that comes to my mind. Romans 16, verse 7, and I have it here in my Bible. The Bible says, this is Paul talking to the Romans, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So these two, we know very little about them, Andronicus and Junia, but they, like others, we assume, were also considered apostles. These two are prominent among or outstanding among the apostles. And uh, what a privilege that they were able to testify to what they have seen and heard. And as Pastor Cortez mentioned, that we too get to be witnesses to what we have seen and heard of God's goodness in the world. I'm, I'm just looking forward to that day that we can talk to these witnesses, these martyrs, and maybe in the Bible, we didn't hear a lot about them or read a lot about them, but they do have a story of witnessing. And I appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Well, let's turn to our question that comes to us via text from Shane. And it says, my wife recently died. Our wedding vows stated until death do us part. I still live, so am I still married? Dr. Bennett, I want to toss this one to you. Uh, very interesting question on marriage and death. Does the Bible say anything about wedding vows? And and what does that mean when one of of them passes? It's a great question. And I want to acknowledge for this viewer who wrote the question, when when his wife died, he still feels married, I bet. Mm. No, it happens very often to those who are grieving. It's not that you suddenly feel unmarried. So what does the Bible say? Are we still married? I'd like to take us to Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And Paul here is using this to illustrate a different point about our relationship to the law and and to grace. But these are the words that he gives us. Romans 7, verses 1 through 3. He says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning her husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So in these verses, we have the example of a, of a woman married to a man who has died. But this gives us a nice, clear picture that when in our vows, it says, till death do us part, that unfortunately, when a, a spouse passes away and death has thereby parted husband and wife, that 
legally speaking, in terms of the law of the land, but also in God's eyes, that they are uh, still wedded together in their hearts, but legally they are no longer married. Mm. And so the possibility then opens up for uh, future marriages for perhaps or other opportunities that would have been prohibited otherwise. Wow. Thank you so much for guiding us through that somewhat delicate question because, yeah, emotion does take a part there and, and that feeling we just don't know what it's like when, when our spouse dies and, and God always wants what's best for us. So thank you so much for guiding us through that. Well, we need to go to our break, but first, I want another reminder to check out the many studies offered at hope.study. Courses are added regularly, so check back often to see what's new. There's even a course called Understand the Bible Like Never Before that explores simple tools and methods for understanding the Bible. If you prefer a hard copy study guide instead, we also have free Bible study guides that we can mail to you in North America. Call and leave us your address and we'll get those to you right away. We're going to take a quick break, but stay here. We'll have more Bible Help Desk. Welcome back to Bible Help Desk. Remember, you can call or text us your questions at 833-BIBLEHD or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or our website at hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. Then watch to see if we answer your question. Today, our guests answering those questions are Dr. Bennett and Pastor Cortez. Well, let's go ahead and jump into a question that came to us via text. And it says, is the Holy Spirit or Comforter going to leave us before Jesus comes? stated in John 14, 19, and 20. Great question, Pastor Cortez. We have here someone who is studying their Bible, diving into the Bible, and now they're questioning this, this concept of the Holy Spirit leaving us. What is the Bible saying here? What, what does the Bible say? So I can, I can address something that is, that is mentioned here. Uh, the verse in John that is referenced, Jesus is not exactly talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's talking that he will be taken away from his disciples, of course, referring to his death. But however, we as Christians, we do have the promises of God, such as in Deuteronomy uh, 31 verse 6, which tell us, Be strong and courageous, do not fear, or be in dread in, of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And we also have a promise that Jesus himself makes in the last verse of Matthew, where he says to his disciples and to all Christians, teaching them to observe all that I have, have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we do have this concept that in this promise that God will be with us always. He will never leave our side and he basically he will be with us until until the, he comes back for us. No. But as Christians and as Adventists, we also believe that there will be a time near the second coming where the presence of God will leave the earth and that gives us a little bit of confusion because how can God be with us? But at the same time, there will be this time of tribulation. And I think we need to recontextualize what this time of trouble will be in the end. If we look to certain passages in the Bible, we will see that there are people who felt the presence of God kind of leaving them or not being with them. And this is referred to in Jeremiah 30, uh, verse 7, as the time of Jacob's trouble. And if you remember, there is this passage when Jacob is about to face his brother Esau for the first time after he betrayed him. And he is just so worried and so worried for his future. And he's asking God to send him a sign to bless him. But God doesn't answer until uh, just a little while after. And this is the time that uh, of trouble that is being referred to it's not that god was not with jacob at that moment but simply that he wasn't giving any tangible signs that of his abiding presence with him 
And we even see Jesus go through a similar pass, a similar uh, stage when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he is pleading and he is praying to God, take this cup away from me if it is at all possible. And at this moment, we see him in deep, deep anguish because he is feeling the weight of sin separating him. And there is no tangible uh, connection that he feels to God. But uh, once again, it is not that God's presence has left him, but simply that there is no tangible um, evidence of his abiding presence. Mm. And I think it will be very similar for us as Christians when we go through the time of trouble at the end. It is not that the Holy Spirit will leave completely and we will be left to our own devices. No, we will still have the Holy Spirit as Jesus and God promised. But we will have to rely on our faith alone because there will be no tangible uh, evidence of that abiding presence. And I think this you know, it, it, we, we can fear and we can be very nervous about what is to come. But one of the things we must never lose faith and hope in is that God is with us every single moment of our lives. Thank you, Pastor Cortez, for such a great answer and just that reminder that God is with us and He will be with us even if uh, this time where we have to use our faith. And I want to read John 14, 19 before I, I toss here to talk, Dr. Bennett. And it says, Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. Verse 20 goes on to say, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. I wanted to read that text to give it a little bit of context. Dr. Bennett, now we have heard this text and, and Pastor Cortez laid a great foundation when it comes to this and, and how the Holy Spirit or Comforter and our viewers wondering will leave us. What else can we add? I'm so glad you brought us back and Pastor Cortez also addressed the context here in John chapter 14. Uh, it does sound without enough context, we could be confused by verse 19 that this is talking about Jesus. Excuse me, this is talking about the spirit leaving. But as Pastor Cortez says, this is about Jesus. In fact, um, I think our clear answer is in the same chapter, chapter 14, verse 16. John chapter 14, verse 16. These are the words of Jesus, same passage, same conversation. He says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, mm. to be with you forever. Mm. And so I love that word right there at the end, Ruben, that the Holy Spirit will be with us forever. The one whom Jesus sends will be with us forever. Jesus has promised us, our Father has promised us, He will never leave us or forsake us. And how is it that He's with us? He is with us in and by the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that, pointing that out. And I, I agree, that word forever will be with us. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Let's go ahead and go into our next question via text from Janelle. And it says, at the second coming, everyone will have to answer for their actions. Does this include what we have asked forgiveness over? I thought once we ask for forgiveness, God wipes that particular sin away and he remembers it no more. What a great question. Dr. Bennett, I want to turn to you with this question at the judgment. Um, and we've talked about forgiveness. And we've, for those of us that grow up in the church, we know that God remembers our sins no more when we ask for forgiveness. So what will it be like? What does the Bible say it will be like when it comes to the judgment? I'd like us to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. I think this is probably where Janelle was thinking about answering at the second coming of Christ. The Bible says, For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. So, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive recompense. In her words, as, as the questioner put it, to answer for our actions. Well, does that mean that we will be rewarded or punished for what we've done but been asked and forgiven for? Mm. For that answer, let's go to Psalm 103, verse 10 and verse 12. The Bible speaks clearly about what God does with our sin. 
Psalm 103 verse 10, the Bible says, He, meaning God, does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Now, I think that is great news. Yeah. We are forgiven in Christ by faith. We are so forgiven that it's as far as the east is from the west. The east and the west, as far as I know, never ever touch each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you could just keep going around the globe and we'll never meet yeah. again. The Bible is full of promises for God's forgiveness. So what does it mean that we would be rewarded for what we've done in our body? Will we still be punished for our sins yeah. when Christ comes again? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Because in Christ, God does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. And we can count on that promise on 103 verse 10, because it's right here in God's word. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett, for answering that question and pointing us to God's word and that that affirmative no, that once we are forgiven, God does not remember those. And as far as I know, the East and the West never connect. And I hope our viewer, Janelle, can be reminded of that. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Cortez, I want to turn to you now. Uh, in this final minute that we have, what else can we add to this question about forgiveness and judgment? I would like once again to wholeheartedly agree with what Dr. Bennett shared with us. We do have the promise, especially in Isaiah 43, verse 25, where God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So we do know that there is a judgment coming, but as I imagine the scene, we get to the God's, God's courthouse, and the, the role will be called up, and it will say, um, Hadid, this is the record. It has been paid for in full by Christ's blood. Go in peace. Mm. Amen. Such a powerful, powerful imagery that we have when it comes to knowing that God goes before us and Jesus has paid that price for us. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Cortez, for that grateful reminder, as well as you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us here on the program and for just providing such insight into God's Word. I know I've been blessed and I hope our viewers have been blessed as well. Thank you both for joining me. And we want to thank you, the viewer, for watching and sending in your questions. Don't forget to check out our website and our YouTube account for video on-demand questions and answers from Bible Help Desk. And you can send in your questions by texting us or calling and leaving a voicemail or messaging us on our Facebook or Instagram.